in a port where his train is out. Here comes the spin. Here it comes. Yeah, we see it down here, Bill. It's beautiful. Okay, Mike, we're at uh, 52, coming back down to 51 RPM. Roger, we copy. You guys look good. And Columbia, Houston, everyone down here is go for deploy with two minutes left over Hawaii. the crew of Shuttle Mission 5 did. Only eight hours into the first operational flight of the Space Shuttle program, fifth flight of the orbiter Columbia. The first four missions were test flights to prove the space transportation system could provide access to low Earth orbit on a routine basis. Those missions laid the groundwork for the operational era. Shuttle Flight 5 was the beginning of that era. The primary purpose of the mission, to carry two communication satellites into orbit, deploy them from the payload bay, then return to Earth. Columbia, Houston, 30 seconds till LOS, and everything is still go down here for deploy. Roger, Brian, we copy that. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to having a good one. Roger, and good luck. A flawless landing, only minutes after sunrise at Edwards Air Force Base, California, ended Columbia's fifth mission. Looking slightly weathered, the orbiter had traveled over 10 and a half million miles in five flights, spent 24 days on orbit, and circled the Earth almost 400 times. It would now return to Kennedy Space Center, Florida, for refurbishment, to be launched again on Shuttle Flight 9. The newest orbiter in NASA's fleet, Challenger, would fly on Shuttle Flight 6. Many weight-saving improvements had been made. The orbiter itself was almost 2,500 pounds lighter because of structural changes. The external tank weighed 10,000 pounds less than the one used on Shuttle Flight 1. The solid rocket boosters were almost 4,000 pounds lighter. The three main engines were upgraded to 104% of rated thrust. A blanket-like thermal material replaced 600 thermal tiles in non-critical areas. And all 30,000 tiles were densified to improve their durability. This stack could carry over 17,000 pounds more into orbit than Columbia. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, we'll go for main engine ignition. Start. 7, 6, we have main engine ignition.
and liftoff. Yeah. Liftoff of the Orbiter Challenger and the sixth flight of the Space Shuttle. Story, we got a go for deploy. We have a go for deploy. On shuttle flight six, Challenger's cargo, the tracking and data relay satellite, Tedris, and its solid propellant inertial upper stage rocket, the IUS, weighed almost 19 tons. Tedris was the largest, most advanced communication satellite launched to date. That is correct. A major accomplishment in space communications. Tedris is launched from the payload bay by ejection springs, released when explosive bolts are fired. After shuttle moves a safe distance away, the first stage of the IUS rocket fires to boost the satellite from 150 miles to 22,300 miles in altitude. Then the first stage separates. Shortly thereafter, the second stage of the IUS rocket fires to circularize the satellite's orbit. Solar panels and antennas are deployed to provide power and tracking and data relay capability. Having attained a circularized altitude of 22,300 miles and traveling at the same speed as the Earth's rotation, the satellite will remain fixed in orbit over the same location continuously. Later, the first Tedris will be joined by two more identical satellites. The three will form a space communications network, providing almost continuous coverage to Earth orbiting spacecraft, not the 15% ground stations provide. The network will be able to track 26 Earth-orbiting spacecraft simultaneously. And because TDRS satellites only relay data, they do not process it, 20 times more information will be handled by this network than could be by ground stations. All data will be relayed directly to the primary NASA ground terminal, White Sands, New Mexico, and from there via domestic satellite to other NASA centers. Launch of Tedris was on time and nominal. First stage firing of the inertial upper stage also went well. And Sunnyvale and White Sand send you a special attaboy. However, halfway through the second stage firing, ground controllers lost communication with the satellite. It was an hour before even intermittent signals were picked up. They indicated Tedris had not yet separated from the IUS and that both were tumbling at a very high rate of speed. Receiving only intermittent signals from Tedris, using short-life batteries which would soon be depleted, and getting no response to signals sent from the ground, made the outlook for Tedris bleak. Several more hours passed, and then something remarkable happened. Experts still aren't sure why, but either an automatic timing mechanism was engaged, or onboard systems finally acknowledged repeated commands from the ground separating Tedris from the IUS. Well, I do have some uh, words. Now on its own, the satellite stopped tumbling. Ground controllers commanded deployment of the solar array and antennas. However, they quickly learned Tedris was way off course and drifting farther every day. Their only hope of getting it back on course was to use the tiny hydrazine thrusters originally designed for minor attitude and velocity adjustments, not for boosting the two and a half ton Tedris over 8,500 miles farther into space. But at least the satellite was not lost. NASA officials immediately put their plan into effect. Meanwhile, Shuttle Flight 6 continued as planned. 
Uh, okay, we're back with you, Milo, uh, for about 12 more minutes. Got a good TV picture again. Roger, Houston. Got the hatch closed, and we're waiting for a go for deep rest on time. That sounds great, Bo. Copy, we have a go for deep rest on time. That's affirmative, you have a go. Challenger uses with you on the bomb for about seven and a half minutes. Roger, hatch is open. EV-1 is uh, halfway out. They're configuring the airlock, getting ready for Don to come out. Okay, we're watching. Okay, we're watching. It's in, uh, they have a suggested setting for the DAC camera now with the sunlight. Okay, Don. This was America's first spacewalk in nine years. The astronauts were attached by safety tethers to slide wires running just inside the payload bay. They wore a new design in spacesuits, also called extravehicular mobility units. A portable life support system was worn on the back, eliminating the need for a lifeline connected to the orbiter. These suits are not custom built for each astronaut. Tops and bottoms of different sizes can be mixed. They are also more flexible than previous space suits. The crew removed tools from a storage locker in the front part of the payload bay. Then moved aft again. Using a cable run through a winch mounted on the bulkhead, then tied to the cradle that had held the IUS, the astronauts demonstrated they could have lowered the cradle manually had commands from on board failed. There is Velcro here over the outer hatch. That's what I'm going to do, sorry. Velcro in the inner hatch over there. Don't draw the I'll kick it loose. Winch operations were tested on the front bulkhead using an exergeny as a load to see how many pounds the winch and line could handle. The back pocket. Okay, I'll try that. Lastly, the tools were restowed, and the astronauts re-entered the spacecraft. Indian Ocean for two and a half. Perhaps the most visually spectacular mission since America's first landing on the moon, Shuttle Flight 7 gave us our first glimpse of the orbiter from a distance. Another space first. John, we have had uh, one more of those intermittent dropouts, but uh, the spas came right back up and uh, no other problems. Thank you. The magnificent views were provided by a European payload called SPAS. We copy. Roger that. SPAS is an acronym for Shuttle Pallet Satellite, a unique reusable space platform built by the West German aerospace company Messerschmitt Balkov Blom, with generous financial assistance from the West German Federal Ministry of Research and Technology. In addition to having American television and film cameras mounted on spas, 10 experiments belonging to the West German government, the European Space Agency, and NASA were on the platform. MBB wanted to validate the satellite's design and prove experiments could be operated while spas was free-flying. NASA wanted to show the remote manipulator system could handle the two and a half ton payload. And uh, TJ, we just turned on the mass spec to, to warm it up. I assume that you wanted us to do that. Uh, affirmative, Sally. Thank you. Okay, TJ, we're with you, and uh, John performed a beautiful release. The orbiter's ability to station keep with spas was also demonstrated. 
At this point, they are 1,000 feet apart. Here, Spas and Challenger are 200 feet apart. Thrusters on board the orbiter were fired to record the effect on Spas. Spas was rebirthed for return to Earth. They sure are nice. I've been told that some crews in the past uh, have announced that uh, we deliver. Well, from Flight 7, we pick up and deliver. We certainly hope so. The remark by Shuttle Flight 7's commander meant not only had the SPAS operation been successful, but that the crew also deployed two communication satellites. A Canadian satellite to be used for one of the world's first direct-to-home pay TV services, and an Indonesian satellite. It would increase high-speed data transmission and telecommunication service to that country's remote island locations. Roger, uh, the weather at KSC is getting worse instead of getting better, so it looks like we're a no-go for KSC. Shuttle Flight 7 was to be the first landing of an orbiter at Kennedy Space Center, Florida. But bad weather conditions did not allow it. Challenger would touch down instead at Edwards Air Force Base, California, the alternate landing site. Roger. During the period of communications blackout, usually lasting about 15 minutes, temperatures on the vehicle's surface reach their peak. The temperature of the red-hot glow seen through Challenger's front windows was about 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. One astronaut described the view as like being inside a furnace. Yeah, processing Western Test Range data. Uh, Houston, Challenger, loud and clear. Nice and smooth all the way down. Real good, Crip. Been running about uh, five to seven tenths. Later on, trip on the right. Roger, we see that. Approximately two months after Tidris was first launched from Shuttle's cargo bay on Flight 6, the final firing needed to place the satellite in its correct orbit was executed. Copy. Go ahead for the burns. Personnel began immediately to check out communication systems on board and initiate a series of important ground tests with the satellite essential to its operation on upcoming shuttle flights. Processing Tedris. First use of Tedris with shuttle was on mission eight. Challenger Houston with you on Tedris. Houston, Challenger loud and clear. How do you read the CDR? Roger, loud and clear also. Challenger, this is Houston with you through Hawaii for seven Also minutes. conducted on shuttle flight eight was check out of the remote manipulator system and payload flight test article. You're lying clear too, Dale, and uh, looks like you're right on schedule. The 8,500-pound structure was the heaviest object lifted by the arm to date, more than double the weight of any previous payload. 
Data gathered during the checkout was used to plan the Solar Max repair mission. On that flight, a 20,000 pound payload would be deployed, and an orbiting satellite would be retrieved. We're ready to deploy it. That's good news. Flight 8 marked the sixth successful launch of a satellite by shuttle. It was an Indian communications satellite which would bring telecommunications, television, and badly needed weather information to remote areas of that country. Because Challenger was launched at night on shuttle flight 8, parts of the southern hemisphere never seen or photographed from space were visible during daylight hours. The first night landing for the space shuttle program occurred on Mission 8 with safe touchdown of Challenger at Edwards Air Force Base, California. After making its first voyage into space on Shuttle Flight 4, the continuous flow electrophoresis system, Cephas, flew again on shuttle flights 6, 7, and 8. The device is a prototype of a production unit to purify material for the treatment of disease. It was built by McDonnell Douglas Corporation and flown on shuttle as part of a joint agreement between NASA, McDonnell Douglas Corporation, and Ortho Pharmaceuticals Corporation, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. Houston, uh, Combined results from flight 6 and 7 demonstrated that Cephas could separate over 700 times more material and impurities four times higher than could be achieved in Earth's gravity. Shuttle flight 8 was the first use of Cephas to separate living cells. Some of the samples were separated to continue research at Pennsylvania State University and Johnson Space Center, Texas. The McDonnell Douglas samples were used to further diabetes research at Washington University Medical School, Missouri. Other scientific activity conducted on shuttle flights 5 through 8 also focused, as the Cephas had, on research and materials processing, greatly enhanced when performed in the weightlessness of space. The monodisperse latex reactor flown on shuttle flights 3 and 4 flew again on missions 6 and 7 in a continuing attempt to improve the production of polystyrene latex microspheres for cancer research and treatment and glaucoma research. Five student experiments flew on the four shuttle flights as part of an annual science competition co-sponsored by NASA and the National Science Teachers Association. Studies ranged from fluid convection, to sponge and crystal growth, to biofeedback. A total of 23 getaway special canisters were flown on shuttle flights 5, 6, 7, and 8. Some contained stamped envelopes from the U.S. Post Office commemorating spaceflight. Others grew snow, exposed seeds to zero gravity, and studied the effects of weightlessness on a colony of ants. NASA's Getaway Special Program is a unique opportunity to fly small, self-contained payloads on board shuttle on a space-available basis at a very low cost. Perhaps the studies with the most human interest were those done on space adaptation syndrome, also known as space motion sickness, a malady which affects approximately half of all astronauts. The most extensive studies of SAS were done on Flight 8, focusing primarily on the neurological system. Aural sensitivity was tested, eye movements, and repeated physical motion. Measurements were taken of limb volume and external tissue pressure. If any of these tests look torturous, it's no wonder the crew dubbed the doctor's mid-deck working area a chamber of horrors, and mockingly gave him a taste of his own medicine Astronaut crews got along exceedingly well with each other on missions 5, 6, 7, and 8. 
yet they were the largest, most diverse crews in the history of spaceflight. Flight 5 carried the first four-person crew. Flight 6, calling themselves the Over the Hill Gang, tallied up all their years of experience to get this grand total. Flight 7 carried the first five-person crew, including the first American woman to fly in space, Sally Ride. Flight 8 included the first black American to fly in space, Guyane Bluford. And the oldest person to fly in space to date, Dr. William Thornton. With ejection seats gone from the flight deck, and water storage tanks and instrumentation gone from the mid-deck, there was much more room to accommodate the larger crews. There was also opportunity for privacy. Exercise. And as usual on any important trip, plenty of food. The success of flights 5, 6, 7, and 8 represented many accomplishments for the space shuttle program. More importantly, the missions proved the operational capability of the space transportation system. That useful work can be done in space for the benefit of people on Earth. But the program has really just begun. orbiter in the shuttle fleet, Discovery, will be launched in 1984. The fourth orbiter, Atlantis, will be ready for use in 1985. New astronauts are being recruited. 73 shuttle flights are scheduled through 1988. The outlook for the future of America's space shuttle program is excellent. And there appears to be no end in sight.